Now, I'm here to talk about style and dress codes, uh, and more to the point, um, I'm here to encourage you to appreciate something which we all too often take for granted. That's the fact that everyone in this theater is legally free to wear more or less whatever he or she wants. Now, this is a rare freedom that we have, and I think we should uh, exercise it, and I think we should dress more boldly in order to appreciate it. Um, I've worked as a designer of menswear for several years, and um, I've also studied the sartorial phenomenon known as dandyism for about a decade now. Uh, two years ago, I published a book with the photographer Rose Callahan called I Am Dandy, The Return of the Elegant Gentleman. Now, uh, when you hear the word dandy, you might think of a sort of Oscar Wilde type, wealthy, older, white, gay, idle. Um, the fact is, that's not the standard. There's no such thing as a standard dandy. We met men of all ages, races, sexual orientations, occupations, beliefs. Uh, the one thing they all had in common is they were pursuing elegance, but each man pursued it uh, to his own definition. This is a very personal thing. They're all obsessed with dressing. They had a great love of dressing that was common to their core. Uh, one thing I say in the introduction is that these are men who do it when nobody else is looking. If they were stranded on a desert island, they would make tie pins out of fish bones and they would polish their shoes with squid ink. Now, one thing I asked uh, every man was whether, if everyone else dressed like them, they would continue dressing this way, and if they thought uh, things would be better if everyone dressed like them. A few of them said, yeah, the world would be a much more beautiful place if everyone dressed as nicely as I did. Um, but for most of them, the individuality of their style was crucial. This was a personal expression. The only way that everyone would dress better is if they were forced to compel to, and that's called a dress code. And we don't have to look too far into our own past to see what that was like. It was tight corsets, high boots, stiff collars. I know this might turn some of you on, but uh, it wasn't all that nice. Uh, people often who are fans of the book will ask me, they'll say, well, you know, Natty, what went wrong? As though at some point in the 1960s, someone invented polyester and everyone lost their damn mind. <laughs> this is pure golden age thinking. The fact is, the rise of casual wear is a byproduct of increased sartorial freedom which is ultimately a good thing. Um, old photographs might have a sort of unity of style, they might look quite nice, um, but anything, including style, loses its power once it becomes mandatory. Dandyism requires freedom. It's an expression of that freedom, it's an appreciation of that freedom. And for some of us, the best thing about not having to wear a tie is getting to wear a tie. There's a lot of ties. Now, neckties are actually a great place to start when talking about sartorial symbolism. Um, to us, um, well, actually, as far as I can tell, it's the only accessory that I know of where not wearing one can be making a statement. Uh, I said this once at a party, and some guy said, yeah, well, what about pants? <laughs> now, I think if you think of pants as an accessory, <laughs> you've got bigger problems. Now, if it's pushing aside any Freudian temptations when talking about neckties, they've always been a symbol of conformity. It's mandatory for any serious professional male to wear a necktie. Uh, for critics, it's a perfect symbol of corporate slavery, having to wear a silk cord around your neck at all times. But for the average man in the gray or navy suit, uh, it's often the only part of their wardrobe where they do get to express themselves. Usually they're just expressing something like a membership in a club or a university or a regiment, or in the case of a piano key necktie, a horrible sense of humor. <laughs> but uh, this, is, uh, this is in the West, where, where we take these things quite for granted. In some countries, Neckties actually mean a lot more. In Iran, it's illegal, for example, to sell neckties. This is because some religious hardliners view them, believe it or not, as symbols of Western decadence. It's not illegal to own one or wear one, and people often do for uh, special occasions, for weddings, but if you were to wear one uh, every day, it could be seen as suspiciously pro-Western. So bow ties can be a potent little piece of silk. Uh, or neckties can be a potent little piece of silk. Bow ties are another matter altogether. I think for years the only people wearing them were Louis Farrakhan and Pee Wee Herman. Um, I think the best you can say about a bow tie is that it will, it will increase your chances of being assaulted, but it will make you harder to strangle. <laughs> now, this is a great example of sartorial liberty right here, in action. These are the sapors of Brazzaville, photographed for Danielle Tamagini's excellent book, The Gentleman of Bokongo. Um, they live in the Congo. Uh, Rose and I are hoping to include them in volume two of I Am Dandy. Uh, these men, I went and spent a week with them in Brazzaville, following them around, 
going to their nightclubs, talking to them, lurking as much as a man in a white linen suit can be said to lurk. And um, they're an incredibly inspirational group. Uh, they work long hours at menial jobs just to afford the clothes that they wear on the weekends. They live in shanty, uh, shanty towns, but uh, when they go out, they're as chic as any man in London or New York or Paris. Um, they're the embodiment of a phrase that was used to describe the mods in England in the 1960s, which is clean living in difficult circumstances. They're also local celebrities. Uh, children shout out their nicknames when they walk down the street. Le roi du couleur, for example. Now, some locals accuse them of being selfish materialists. This is a common uh, criticism of dandies. They say, why are these men playing dress up when we have serious problems in this country? But other people I spoke to recognize them as a vital cultural force, a symbol of the nation's creative spirit and elan. Um, for years, Congo Brazzaville was ruled by an authoritarian African nationalist government that eschewed Western dress and that demanded people wear native African garb. Uh, the Sapors were a reaction to that and quite a brave one, I think. Um, after civil war, they emerged as a gleeful assertion of their right to live and dress how they please. Now, it might be hard for us to imagine in this country a specific article or style of clothing being banned for political reasons. We do have dress codes. Uh, for example, any private institution is free to impose any aesthetic standard they choose. Um, although it might not be in their best interest to do so, who among us thinks that the Metropolitan Opera would last a week if they demanded that everyone wore a black tie or even adhere to the dress code of the average strip club? Um, I'm quite sympathetic to people who are for dress codes in these circumstances, who say that the experience of theater or the opera is cheapened by a casual atmosphere, or who say that uh, the person on stage is disrespected, dis disrespected by those in the audience who didn't dress up. Now, I can see you, some of you squirming right now at the thought. But uh, on the other hand, who am I to tell an octogenarian in jeans and sneakers who's studied opera his whole life, who appreciates the art form, who loves its practitioners, who knows more about it than I ever could hope to, that he needs to go put on a jacket. Uh, fortunately, Rose is now the uh, official photographer for the Metrop Metropolitan Opera Style blog, so uh, there's an incentive to dress up, which I think is good. Um, now, it's harder for us to imagine a public dress code in this country. Um, dressing is protected as freedom of speech, free expression. And just in the same way that our, our freedom of expression is only prescribed in the most narrow uh, of cases, direct threats, um, the same is for our national dress code. Basically, you're not allowed to expose your genitals in public, so no going full leather cravats. <laughs> now, <laughs> I've been speaking mainly about men so far, because that's my usual wheelhouse, but obviously questions about what a woman can and should wear uh, have been central to issues of feminism, equality, and so on. Um, some of you may have heard that one of the possible reasons that women's garments button on the opposite side of men's is that men have always dressed themselves, but women used to be dressed by other people. It wasn't that long ago that a woman wearing trousers was considered something radical. Uh, Oscar Wilde's wife Constance was one of the uh, most vocal um, advocates of women's dress reform in the late 19th century. We've come a very long way since then. We now have a free the nipple movement. Um, this is aimed at the hypocritical idea that a, a woman's bare chest is uh, somehow more obscene than a man's. And an even more absurd idea that a breast isn't exposed unless the nipple is visible. Now, I think that uh, it's a sign of how far we've come that the area of contention has shrunk to the size of an areola, uh, <laughs> at least until there's a liberate the labia or emancipate the anus movement. Um, we also have, more, a little bit more seriously, we have in this country the slut walk movement. Now, this was begun when a police officer told women that they should um, avoid dressing like sluts so as not to be raped. Now, people were rightly outraged at the idea that it was a woman's responsibility to dress a certain way to prevent her own assault. Uh, women took to the streets in lingerie in various forms of undress to uh, insist that, uh, that they not be shamed for what they choose to wear and that it was, not their responsibility, it was not their responsibility to be modest, but men's responsibility to respect them and their decisions. Again, this is in a place where we, we take these things for granted, um, these ideas, at least. Um, as you all know, in some Islamic countries, there are quite strict dress codes, um, specifically for women. 
Um, it's a religious dress code, but it's a dress code nonetheless. Um, in secular democracies, an interesting, an interesting thing happens when religious codes um, come into contact with civil codes. In order to preserve uh, our ideas of religious freedom, often religious codes will supersede civil ones. This is why, for example, Sikhs in India who wear turbans don't have to wear crash helmets when they ride scooters. Uh, it's why mandatory facial hair is exempt, or religiously mandated facial hair is exempt from uh, military regulations. Now, as we've seen in recent years in Europe, and most recently in Canada, it's a hot button issue, uh, a cultural conflict about uh, women's right to wear the hijab or the burqa. Um, and I think people should ask a question, is it more offensive for a police officer to suggest that women, uh, it's a woman's responsibility to dress modestly than it is for a cleric to say the same thing or for a holy book to mandate it? These are questions people should ask, I think. Um, or are these things uh, off limits from criticism uh, on grounds of cultural sensitivity or relativism? Uh, should slut walkers also protest mandatory religious dress codes if they're applied unevenly to the genders. I, I think the issue comes down to sartorial consent. Are these things that people are wearing of their own free will? If so, there's no problem. Um, are people being coerced, pressured by peer groups, by clerics, by their families, by communities to dress a certain way? Then there is a problem if it's not of their free choice. Uh, I'm personally against all dress codes, whether they're political, cultural, or religious. And I see no contradiction between defending a woman's right to follow a religious dress code and criticizing the dress code itself. Um, and I reserve that right. I also think that you should question the motives of anyone who would tell you how to dress a certain way. One can only imagine the perverse conclave that came up with the Catholic schoolgirl uniform. Uh, you know, your grace, the, uh, the skirts are awfully short, they're showing off a lot of leg. Mm, better add knee socks. I think we can all see what happened there. <laughs> now, I think it's very important that we not let other people tell us how to dress, and that we choose this for ourselves. And I think it's important to remember that the simple act of a woman putting on trousers or a man tying a necktie can carry great significance in certain situations. And that these aren't rights that are enjoyed by all people in all places at all times. And I think that every freedom uh, that we have, and that we all too often take for granted, um, we should recognize that it was fought for, and it was won, and it took a long time, and it was relatively recently that we have these kind of rights. And I think those who deny these rights to anyone else are doing them a great disservice. Um, we live in a time and a place of unprecedented sartorial freedom and choice. And what good is this freedom and choice if we don't exercise it? I say dress a little bit more boldly, untether your inner dandy. Our rights are exerted by example. And I think that the more people who dress boldly, who dress uh, innovatively, who exercise their right to express themselves through their own clothing, the more people will feel emboldened and empowered to do the same. I think that this all too brief life is a very, very special occasion. And I think we should all dress up for it. Thanks awfully. Night-night.